We were talking about abnormal chromosome number. And so that is what is referred to as being aneuploid. So A means without a good number of chromosomes. And we talked about Down syndrome as an example of a, a regular aneuploid. But we also have sex, sex aneuploids. And so this has to do with the sex chromosomes. So what was the example that, we, uh, that I provided you with last time? of a sex aneuploid. Nope. That would be trisomy 21, so that was Down syndrome. Turner syndrome, right? So we could have XO. Right, so this would be Turner's syndrome. So these individuals are phenotypically female, but they have some um, problems specifically with fertility, because you can see how that might be a problem and when you're producing eggs that lack an X chromosome entirely, that might lead to some fertility issues, and then just some other um, common characteristics that are a little bit different in people with that combination. So an individual that would be Y-O, right, that is lethal. So that is never seen. So potentially you could get an embryo having this combination of genes, but you would never see it because it is lethal. And so the embryo would never implant or maybe never even start to divide. And so... Um, when you don't see a chromosome of abnormality, it's probably not because that doesn't ever occur, it's because that chromosomal abnormality is lethal. Okay. So this is one that we looked at in lab. And would that individual be phenotypically male or female? Male, right? Because they have the Y chromosome. So they have that sex determining region on the Y chromosome that causes the gonads to become testes and the testes to start producing testosterone. So does anybody remember what this um, syndrome is called? This is actually the most common sex aneuploid that we see in our population. Probably don't remember what it was called, but it is called Kleinfelters. Generally, they're named after the people that first um, noticed them or described them, right? So that is Klinefelter syndrome. Okay. Now we can also have trisomy 13, or not 13, trisomy X. So we could have this, so this is called trisomy X. And this would be a female. And oftentimes, individuals that have this combination do not have any problems. They actually might be taller than average um, because of that extra X chromosome, but you could go you know, undiagnosed, it could be undetected, and you could be trisomy X. Okay. The other interesting example of trisomy for the sex chromosome is XYY. And um, they hesitate to call this, it used to be called Jacob's syndrome, but it really is kind of like trisomy in that it doesn't cause many differences in the phenotype. Sometimes they call them super males. Right? And um, this can be relatively common and undetected. And the interesting thing about this one is, is in the 1960s, somebody had this hypothesis that um, if males had an extra Y chromosome, they would be more predisposed to um, criminal activity. And so what they went, did is they went into the prison populations and genetically tested individuals for this. And they found out that there was quite a few inmates that had an extra Y chromosome. And so then their publication came out and it said, we might want to um, screen for males that have this extra Y chromosome. And there was a big uproar in the um, kind of sociological world um, in that just by genetically screening, perhaps we would change the way that we treat individuals that have this extra Y chromosome. 
And um, perhaps that would be a very bad thing in our society to screen baby boys to see if they have a sexual right chromosome because then they could be raised differently and treated differently, which could have a major effect on the way that they grow up. And so this um, was really interesting because they disproved when they went back and repeated the kind of the experiment that showed that there was a higher proportion of individuals in prison with this genotype, and they discovered that they didn't do a proper sampling of people outside prison. And so there is no significant difference now that we know about it, and have done numerous studies. There's no significant difference in the proportion of males that have this that are outside of prison versus inside prison. Now, having said that, one of the things that it does tend to cause is males to become bigger and larger. And so they might have like large hands and large feet, and they might be taller. And so that is also going to maybe affect the way that they act as they get older. Okay, so that's another example of a sex aneuploid. But you wouldn't probably know it. You wouldn't know it if you were XYY, right? Kleinfelter's and Turner syndrome, um, you start to uh, suspect it um, because there's some developmental delays. And then when they hit puberty, they have some um, different uh, characteristics from normal puberty. Okay, so that those are examples of sex aneuploids. And so now we're gonna talk about what happens to that extra X chromosome in females. And so this is what is called as X inactivation. So this generally occurs in females. And it happens early in embryonic development. So early on in the embryo, one X chromosome is randomly turned off. <coughs> so, um, when we do this, it's like flipping the coin. And so if you look at yourselves, if you're a female and you look at yourselves in your body, you know, it could be that, you know, almost 50% have one X chromosome that, that turned on, and then the other 50% of your cells have the actual the other X chromosome turned on, right? So if we look at this in an example of, let's say we have an X chromosome, and I'm just gonna tell the difference by putting a one and a two, okay? So one and two, right? So this is early during embryonic development, and one of those X, Xs becomes inactivated. So in this cell lineage, we would have X1, and then we have the second X, and it turns into a highly condensed piece of, of genetic material. So the DNA wraps around the chromosome, or, oh, excuse me, around the histone proteins, and this becomes what is called the bar body. Right? So then all the other cells that are produced from this cell have X1 activated and not X2. So it happens and you get these cell lineages. So all the cells that are derived early on all have X1, okay? Then also, obviously, you could have one where you would have the X1 activated and X2 um, active. So this is actually um, the uh, genetic basis for calico coloration in cats. And I'm talking about the cats that have the black and orange. The white is something a little bit different. So if we look at the X chromosomes, they have a gene that codes for either black or orange color, and it is found on the X chromosome. So for example, you could have a big X with a B or an X with a little b, right? And those genes that have the big B um, turned on, they become black. And those that have this one inactivated and this one with a little b active, they become orange. And so they say that you know no calico cat looks exactly like another one because of this random inactivation of the X chromosome 
creating this pattern of coloration on their body. And they also say that if you find a calico cat that is male, right, you can, when we were kids, we were always checking the sex of the calico cats, because if you found a male, the, the theory was is that we would make a lot of money selling them to a genetics lab. Did anybody else do that when they were kids? No. no. <laughs> so we go around, you know, and so um, the idea that if it is um, a male, then it's got to be XXY, right? So be, it would be a, actually a male cat with pine filters, so XXY. So you, you don't generally see calico cats at all female, okay? So if we look at a diagram or an image of this, so this is a calico coloration, right? And sometimes you see those really cool cats that have like lines down the middle of them, right? And all one side black and all one side orange. Now there's another gene that interacts with coat color, and that is where you get the white color, right? So this is a separate gene, right, that determines the white splotches, but that would also be calico coloration, which is a separate gene. So you could ask, is this ever uh, an issue in females? Well, there is actually one disease that we sometimes see, um, or condition, that we sometimes see that is called um, anhydrosis. It's called actually ectodermal. ectodermal. So ectoderm is the skin, the outer skin, and anhydrosis means lack of sweat glands. <coughs> so in this particular instance, there is a mutation on one of the X chromosomes that makes it so that the skin does not produce sweat glands. And actually, when I was a kid, there was a woman um, that I knew that had, like if she sweat, like if she went for a run or anything, she'd actually have a line down her t-shirt, like a straight line. She would sweat on one side and not sweat on the other. Right? So it's kind of like the same thing with that calico coloration, the, the line down the center. And so you see patches here, right, of normal skin and sweat glands. I do not believe that this is the same thing that causes the, the tellum, or what is that, the difference in the patchiness of pigment. Um, but um, this is an example of X, X, X inactivation causing variation in humans. Okay. okay, so we talked about chromosome number. Genetic geneticists also look at the structure of the chromosome. So sometimes the chromosomes break, and you can also get deletions, and you can also get um, additions. So deletions and additions right, are sometimes common. So you can get extra genetic material deleted from a chromosome, um, or you can get genetic material deleted from the chromosome, or you can get accidentally extra uh, genetic material added to the chromosomes. And remember that this could happen because of crossing over. So remember that shuffling of the deck that I said could have a big cost? And the cost is, is that you're going to get more mutations, but the benefit is, is that your offspring are going to be more variable, right? Because that is how we unlink genes. That crossing over gives us greater variation in our offspring. So there is an example of a deletion that we see in humans that is called Cree du chat. And that um, translates from French as cry of the cat because of the way that um, the babies, um, when they're born with this syndrome, um, what the way they sound, they sound like a cat crying, a kitten. And so this is a deletion on chromosome number five. And that deletion doesn't get put anywhere else. And so it just somehow becomes deleted, the chromosomes break, and that genetic material is missing. And remember that when you get a deleted, if you got a chromosome that was missing some genes on chromosome number five, all of your subsequent cells would also be missing that chromosome because you start out as a single cell. So we probably have deletions in other chromosomes, but that would, those would be lethal, right? 
So this just happens to be a deletion that we actually see producing babies. And so a, genetis, a genetic analysis, would, would they would look at this chromosome number five and they would say, this is too short, it's missing a band of genetic information. If we look at it, this is the shortened chromosome and that is the deleted region. And so this is actually the most common syndrome um, caused by um, chromosomal deletion and was one in 20,000 and one in 50,000 babies have this. So it doesn't have to delete the whole chromosome. Just a, a portion of it. And it's probably because of crossing over not working properly and a piece of the chromosome gets somehow left out when it crosses over. And so they have other problems besides just crying. They tend to have abnormal um, shaped skulls. Um, they're small at birth. They have respiratory problems. So all of these would be phenotypic characteristics that are due to missing that specific set of genes. Oh, you wanted to write that whole thing down? <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, would, I would never ask you how common it is. But if you're interested, you want to do your notes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if we look at another type of chromosome, besides deletions and additions, we have what is called inversions. And inversions are where uh, genes get um, removed from the chromosome and then they're put back in in the wrong order, okay? So pieces of DNA are removed. And put back in in the wrong order. back in the wrong order. And inversions do not cause a problem if it doesn't happen inside of a gene. If it happens, and we'll talk about the molecular genetics of it, if it happens in the middle of, G, of the gene, then the protein that is produced could be um, changed. But in this example, they're talking about the difference between, you don't need to know peri versus para. The pericentric means that it includes the Centro, excuse me, the centromere, and para means that it is outside of the centromere. And so C, D is supposed to be the normal chromosome, but then we see D, C, okay? And so that would happen with, um, on either side of the centromere. And then you could also get it outside. So instead of C, E, F, it's D, F, E, for example, okay? So as long as it's not hap happening in the middle of the gene, we have inversions. You might even have an inversion in your genotype that has absolutely no effect. And again, when you're shuffling the deck during crossing over, you can get mistakes being made. Now the problem with inversions, the big problem is, is that when they line up, so like for example, if I had an inversion and when they're lining up to um, shuffle to the genetic material to be exchanged and when my chromosomes are lining up, they want to line up so that the genes line up next to each other. And this is difficult to do if one of your genes has a different sequence. So again, you don't need to know this idea, but it's kind of interesting because our chromosomes will try to line up. So notice that this is in, out of order. So it goes like uh, five, six, seven, instead of seven, six, five. And so in order for our chromosomes to line up, they actually create a loop. And so when people look at these and the chromosomes are lined up, you might actually see a loop in one of the chromosomes because it's trying to line up so that the genes are next to one another so that when crossing over occurs, you do not get mistakes being made. Okay, top one is conforming to the bottom one. It's the, it's right to the bottom one. There. One, two, three. Oh. Actually, the bottom one is conforming to the top one. Because we see this. Okay. So it was out of order, so then the, the, the other chromosome looped itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you get these loopings happening, happening between the chromosomes because they try to line up. Okay. So 
The other idea is, is that sometimes you can get pieces of chromosomes being moved around in your um, genetic material, in your genome. And so translocations are where pieces of DNA move between chromosomes. And again, this is not that big of an issue um, unless it happens to occur where you get a piece of uh, chromosome cut off in the middle of a gene. And it also could be a big issue when you're producing eggs and sperm. So it's not like if my fertility might be decreased if I had a major translocation, but you probably wouldn't know that I had a translocation unless you looked at my genotype and you looked at my karyotype. So if we look at the example from your textbook, it looks like this. Oops. So this sometimes happens where a piece of one chromosome gets moved to the other. So this one and this one got moved to this chromosome. So the chromosomes look different, but there is no gain or loss of genetic information. So this one went, uh, this one, Okay, so this one went to this chromosome and this one went to that chromosome, right? And so this is the resulting chromosomes. And so you would only, sometimes you would only know this if you did a karyotype analysis on a person. If you had problems with fertility, they might do a karyotype analysis and ask why you're not producing viable egg or sperm. And this, this could be a possibility for that. Because right? the chromosomes have to line up. Only during meiosis do we have crossing over occurring. In other instances, we don't. Okay, so those are some abnormal chromosomes, some chromosomal abnormalities. And so we're actually going to start on a new topic today, so a new chapter. I'm not sure what, I think this is chapter 10, okay? We're going to start talking about molecular genetics. So we were talking about traits and characteristics and how they follow a pattern of inheritance in a pedigree and predict making predictions based upon Punnett square analysis. Now we're going to look at what is happening at the molecular level. And so our DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. This is our genetic material. Most organisms use DNA as their genetic material, except for some viruses, which actually use another type of uh, nucleic acid called RNA, and we'll talk about what RNA is to us. But almost all animals, all animals use DNA, okay? So that's our genetic material. And remember that the mo majority of our DNA is found in our nucleus. So this is composed of nucleotides and so this is the building block so like amino acids are the building block for proteins nucleic acids are the build or the nucleotides sorry are the building block of the dna and so the nucleotides consist of um so but consist of um so that's i'm just trying to erase that here Okay, so they consist of a sugar. And that's the deoxyribose part. Okay, this is a five carbon ring. No, not five carbon. Yeah, five carbon ring. Okay, single ring with five carbons. It's a ribose other than six carbons like glucose has. Okay, so this is a type of uh, carbohydrate type of sugar, okay? And it's actually, ribose is actually a monosaccharide, but you don't need to know that. We also have a phosphate group and we have a nucleic acid. And the nucleic acid is actually, um, actually, Let's not talk, let's not say it's a nucleic acid. We'll say, this is easier to remember, it's a nitrogenous base. Okay. 
So the nitrogenous bases in DNA, there are only four different kinds. And this what is what actually makes the nucleotides different from one another. All the nucleotides have uh, deoxyribose and they have a phosphate group. So the nitrogenous base varies. Okay. And so they are um, sometimes described as the A, T, C, and G. So A is short for adenine. T is short for thymine. C is short for cytosine. And G is short for guanine. So that's the language of our DNA. So it's like having a language where you only had four letters and you had to put them together into different combinations. And that is what determines um, how we look, right? My sequence of amino acids, or excuse me, my sequence of, of uh, nitrogen spaces is different from yours. And that is the whole basis for why we look different. We have different phenotypes. Okay, so if we look at, I'm gonna skip uh, through this one. I wanted to talk about. It. Okay, so if we look at the nucleotide, you need to know um, that this is my nitrogenous base. So if I had this on a quiz, right, which is what next Wednesday, and I pointed to that, you'd say, oh, nitrogen, that must be the nitrogenous base, right? Ribose, five carbon ring, right? That's the sugar. And then this is the phosphate group, you think P, you think phosphate, okay? So those are all the same, but the nitrogenous bases differ. And um, so this just shows their structure. Notice that cytosine and thymine are single rings, and guanine and the adenine have double rings. And you don't need to know that, like to remember that, but I want, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, why that is significant, okay? Okay, so. Let me go back and now talk about what this genetic material must be capable of. So it's kind of amazing that with such little variation, A, G, T, and C, we can get all of the things that the genetic material must be able to do, okay? So the first thing that it must be capable of doing is it must be capable of making copies of itself. And we've already talked about this at the chromosomal level. So we talked about an unreplicated chromosome. Turning into a replicated chromosome, right? And now instead of a single copy of the gene A, I have two copies of the gene A. And then those chromosomes can separate and we can produce two daughter cells from one parent cell. So we have to be able to make a copy of itself in order to pass that information down from one cell to the other. Okay. The second thing that we have to have happening is, is that it must be capable of coding for biologically significant molecules. So when we look at the molecules in your body, all of them are biologically significant, but what could code for the differences that we observe between individuals, right? So for biologically significant molecules that explain the differences observed between individuals. not only individuals, but between species, like the differences between an earthworm and a jellyfish, for example. So what determines a person being light colored versus dark colored? Melanin, and what type of molecule is melanin? Anybody know? Is it a sugar, is it a protein? It's a protein, right? So the differences in skin color are due to differences in melanin, which is a protein. 
what would be the difference if I am lactose tolerant or intolerant? What is that? What would you, how would you test if you were going to test these and say, oh, you're tolerant or you're intolerant? What would you look for? Not the glucose. You look for the lactase. And lactase is a enzyme, which is a protein. Okay. So the significance here is, is that proteins, right? Proteins are super important, and they can also catalyze different chemical reactions, and they can build the other molecules, right? So we could have proteins that are specifically designed to build <laughs> triglycerides, or to build collagen, or to build other, um, uh, actually collagen is a protein, to build um, nucleotides, right? So proteins are super important. And this is really significant because um, the scientists, when they were first trying to figure out in like 1920, they didn't know what the DNA was. In 1940, they couldn't figure out what it was, and they thought it was actually protein. They thought our genetic material was protein because protein is super variable. We have 20 different amino acids that can go together in any combination. And the DNA seemed so unvariable, only four letters explaining the differences, and so they actually thought protein was the genetic material until they did some experiments which showed unequivocally that it was actually the DNA. Okay. So the third thing that it must be capable of is undergoing rare changes. And we learn from lab that these rare changes are called what? The rare changes, like the going from a T to a C in your genetic code would be called a mutation. Okay, so mutations. So mutations are the only way to get new genetic variation. Okay. So the only way that we went from being only brown eyes to blue eyes is having blue eyed people is through a genetic mutation, right? Because if it's not present in the population at all, that mutation is not present, it can't, you know, it's not there, then you have to have a mutation in order for that variation. So variation is really important. Rare in that we actually have our DNA, when it makes a copy of itself, we have proofreading enzymes. And they go through and they proofread the DNA, but occasionally mistakes do not get corrected, and then we get mutations happen. Okay, so the rare changes, the random changes, and so the genetic material has to be able to do that. And I'll explain how it does that in a little bit. Okay. Okay. So if we look at the structure of the DNA, right? This is my base, and then if we look at how they are put together, okay. So you probably have seen the idea of the double helix. So the DNA in its three-dimensional form is double-stranded, and it coils around itself, right? So if we look at the structure of DNA, oops, go back, okay. It is, um, the structure of DNA is double-stranded. And it is a helix, right? So it coils. The reason why it's double-stranded is, is that we have pairing of bases. And so we can talk about the DNA molecule as having the sides of the ladder. So this is like the DNA ladder, right? The sides are composed of sugar phosphate. Right? The rungs of the DNA ladder, and I'm going to put these little dots here, and you should kind of know what those dots are, what they mean. Okay? The rungs are the uh, nitrogenous bases. So the rungs are the nitrogenous bases. What do the little dots represent? What kind of bond? 
hydrogen, right, and is weak. And so when the DNA makes a copy of itself, it actually comes apart and becomes single-stranded because that's a weak bond, so the DNA can actually come apart. Okay, so this was actually discovered, and I think it was published first in like 1953, right? So if you think about that, to me, that's not that long ago, right? 1953 was the first time we actually knew what the DNA, what, what the genetic material was and what it looked like. So all that work by Morgan and Gregor Mendel was before we even knew what the genetic material was. So if we look at the, um, the structure, we have what is called Shargoff's rule. To make this strand so that it doesn't get big and skinny and big and skinny, we have to pair it so that the nitrogenous bases line up so you have a little nitrogenous base, and then you have one that is, has double ringed, and they come together. So you just need to know that A pairs with T, and G pairs with C. So adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. And that is just a rule, right? That's just the way that our genetic material is built. If you had, like, adenine pairing with guanine, then you get, like, this big bulge, and then it would come back together, and then a big bulge, right? But it's a, it's soft, it's a straight line, so that's the idea of that. Okay? So that is something that you need to remember. Um, because that is going to be important when um, determining how genes code for proteins. Oops, let's show you this. Okay, so here, this is my rung. This is my ladder. This is my sides of my ladder. And then this is my rung. Sorry, this is my rung. And so notice that uh, a little nitrogenous base pairs up with a larger one here. A little one pairs up with the larger one here. So you should be able to kind of figure out um, the parts of the nucleotide from a diagram like that. Now we're not gonna talk about the way that the, the rungs of the, or excuse me, the sides of the ladder run. So don't worry about this five prime versus three prime. It just has to do with the orientation of the sugars. Um, so that they, the, the sugars are oriented opposite one another um, in the five prime versus the three prime strings. But we're not gonna talk about it in that much detail. Okay. So let's talk about DNA replication. So replication is what is referred to as being semi-conservative. And what that means is, is that one strand is conserved, one parental strand is conserved, and a new strand is built as a template, right? So I'll just put that one parental strand serves as a template. For building another strand. If it wasn't conserved at all, what would happen is, is that you'd have parental DNA and then you'd have new DNA, right? So if it was completely conserved, actually if it was completely conserved, you would have the, the original DNA always being together and not being separated and producing a, a new copy of the DNA. Okay, so that's the idea of semi-conservative replication. And there's some really cool experiments that they did in order to discover that. Okay, so the other thing about DNA replication is it takes enzymes. So it requires enzymes. And enzymes are also coded for by the DNA. But remember, enzymes are really important. One of these is called helicase. And helicase unwinds the helix. Right? And then we get the separation of the DNA strands.
And then we have another enzyme, which is called DNA polymerase. So if you look at this name, polymer means a large molecule, and ACE means that it's an enzyme. So this is the enzyme that builds a new strand of DNA. So it reads the sequence, and it will build a new sequence identical to um, the uh, to, and as a complement to the parental strand. Okay. So if we look at an example of this, so if this is my original strand of DNA, and I have my sequence. Okay, so there's my original sequence. Using Shargoff's rule, you should be able to tell me what the complementary strand would be. So A always pairs with T, T pairs with A, right? C pairs with G, G pairs with C, A, okay? So that is just something, that's the Shargoff's rule, the idea that I can take the parental strand and build, um, a, a, using it as a template, build a complementary strand of DNA. Okay, so if we look at in your book, they talk about this idea of semi-conservative DNA replication. If this is the parental strand, the new daughter strands, right, the new daughter DNA has one parental and one new strand being produced. Okay. And then these guys would serve as the parental and then pass their, their genes on in the next generation. So this shows um, the DNA polymerase doing its work, right? So here the DNA polymerase is shown, I can't really see it very clearly on this diagram. But in your book, it's actually, well that's really weird, it's completely gone. The DNA polymerase in this actually shows it as this. There's like a circle around it. And this is the enzyme that is building the strand, okay? So this, it unwinds and it unzips, and then the daughter strands are produced, and so it just replicates down the length of the chromosome. And you have to remember that our genetic material is three billion bases long, okay? Right? So three billion letters that are arranged in, on different chromosomes, but if you think about the, the size of chromosome number one, right, this is what is happening, and it actually happens in different places, but it opens it up and zips it and produces a new um, daughter strand of DNA. So here, it made a mistake. Let's see. Oh, actually, we'll talk about repair in a, in a little bit. Okay. Okay, so I don't want to talk about DNA testing today. Okay. DNA polymerase builds a new strand. So yes, the DNA polymerase builds a new strand using Shargoff's rule. So it applies Shargoff's rule and builds a new complementary strand that is complementary to the to the original parent strand. Okay, we'll talk about DNA testing um, next week. So on your syllabus, it says that we're doing lab next Wednesday, but we're not. I don't know. that. I think that came over from last year. So you can just, we're going to be meeting and just doing lecture. So there is no lab next week. We're just doing lecture next Wednesday because Monday is Memorial Day. Okay. So the question is, how does DNA code for protein? And in order for us to know how it codes for protein, we have to look at the genetic code. And the genetic code is universal. Okay. Which means that you could take a gene from a plant and you could stick it into one of my cells and my um, my cells would be able to read that information. So that's the genetic code. So the genetic code, remember, is in the sequences of DNA. So the sequence of DNA. So the sequence of nitrogenous bases. 
is what is important. Okay. So before we get to talking about how we read the genetic code, I want to talk about how we get that information out of the nucleus. Okay. So there is kind of a diagram that we can draw, an image that we can draw. DNA makes a copy of itself. And so this idea, this is called replication. But remember that our DNA stays in the nucleus. So the DNA makes a copy of itself. Mutations can arise during that process. That information has to get out of the nucleus, right? So we have to take that sequence of nitrogenous bases and we have to turn it into a different type of molecule and that is referred to as messenger RNA. Okay, remember that you can abbreviate that as mRNA. Now this process of making a copy of the sequence of nitrogenous bases is what is referred to as transcription. So think about if you were going to sit down with um, a book that you couldn't take out of the library, it was in the library, you could not check it out, so you were really interested in one paragraph from that book. So you would sit down with a piece of paper and you would write out that paragraph or you could take it to the copy machine and copy just that paragraph so you could leave with it, right? And so think about transcribing is just making a copy, making a copy of that sequence of nucleic acids, okay? So the messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus and then we turn this information into protein. And this takes place in the cytoplasm. And if you'll remember from our discussion of eukaryotic cells, um, so it's in cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm, I guess, in the cytoplasm. Attached to, or on, we'll put actually on ribosomes. Sorry, on ribosomes. So ribosomes are proteins, but that is where this process of going from messenger RNA to proteins um, applies. And this is what is referred to as translation. Okay, so why is it called translation and not just like transcription two? Why can't we just call it transcription one and transcription two? Anybody know? Is it actually it doesn't change it, but it's like going from one language to another. So like if you have a translator, so like messenger RNA, that's A, T, C, actually it's not T, A, U, G, right, we'll talk about that, but it's, it's, a, it's those nucleic acids, right, those nucleotides, and proteins is amino acids. So it's two different languages. It's the language of um, nucleic acid and the language of amino acids. And so that's why it's called translation. So that's how I remember the difference between transcription, making a copy, and translation, turning it into another language. Okay. So that's the process of translation. Okay. So if we look at RNA, We need replication it. that happened like when you drew the little arrow going around oh, the DNA. Was that's that replication. replication. So I just said that DNA is making a copy of itself, so that's why they draw it like they is this that is a different replication than what the Nope, that's just what we talked about. So the genetic material makes a copy of itself, um, and then it can separate into two cells. Right. So that this is just kind of a schematic about how they talk about how they relate replication to transcription to translation. I don't know if it's in your book. I wanted to draw it out here because it makes sense to me um, that putting those three things together. Okay, so if we look at the RNA characteristics, OK, 
okay? RNA will put versus DNA. Okay. RNA is single stranded. It is not double stranded. It's called RNA because it has a ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose sugar. So it's a ribose sugar. So the sugar is a little bit different. And it also, instead of thymine, so there's no thymine, and I don't understand why this is, but instead of thymine, um, it uses uracil. So if I was to look at the sequence of um, nucleotides and it said ATC, I would know it's talking about DNA. If I says AUC, then I know it must be talking about RNA. So U's are only found in RNA. T's are found in DNA. Okay. So let's look at um, transcribing a piece of DNA. So if this is my sequence of DNA, okay, there's my sequence of DNA. I know that this is DNA because there's a T in it, right? That is my DNA. And we can say that this is my coding strand. So this is the this is the strand of DNA that I am going to turn into a protein. Okay. So my messenger RNA, and I'll use a different color here, applying Shargoff's rule, A pairs with, or excuse me, T pairs with U, nope, T pairs with A. Okay. C pairs with A pairs with U. No T. G pairs with? How about this one? Okay. So the mistake that everybody makes when they do this transcription is, is that they just go through and they replace the T's with U's. So if I just put a U here, that would be wrong, right? I have to use Shargoff's rule. So you apply Shargoff's rule, but where there would be a T, there's no longer a T, a U gets inserted, okay? So this would be my messenger RNA. Oops, wrong thing. So this is my mRNA, okay? So this process, this was transcription. So then this messenger RNA is going to get maybe modified, but we'll talk about the modification of the messenger RNA before it leaves the nucleus. But eventually this would go out into the cytoplasm and get translated, okay? So let's look at how it would be translated, okay? So this is translation. And what is it gonna get translated into? Not nucleotides, but what? sequences of amino acids, right? And so the key here to translation is, is that we have what is called, and I ran out of room here on my overhead, so I'm gonna write here, codon, a codon, okay? So a codon is a sequence of three nucleotides on the messenger RNA. Okay, so the DNA doesn't have codons. The messenger RNA is what has codons, okay? So in order to code, if you think about it, if it was a one-to-one -one association, so like, so like if adenine coded for, if this A coded for just one amino acid, and the G coded for just one amino acid, and the U coded for just one amino acid, then we could only have four amino acids. Right? If two, if the codon was two, then that still doesn't produce enough variation. It's like 16 possibilities, right? So we have to have three to explain all the different amino acids, to, to explain how all the uh, three, all the 20 different amino acids 
could be coded for, okay? So this is one codon right here. And this is my other codon. So the question is, how do I know what codon codes for which amino acid? And that is what you have to look at in a table, okay? So that you have to use a table. So you have to know how to use the tables. There's different types of tables. We're going to talk, we're going to, I'm going to show you how to use the table to figure out, okay? So I think I have to skip a couple of pages here because I don't want to talk about messenger RNA processing right now. Sorry. Ah, where's my, where is it? I might have to look it up online. Forgot my table. Hmm. It's embarrassing. Okay. So let me go and find a table. So all you have to do is type in genetic code and you'll come up with all kinds of tables or charts. Okay. So this is my genetic code. So you have to tell me which, which ones I labeled or which ones I, what did we write down? What's the first code on? ACU. ACU. This is threonine, or you could just write down THR. The first code on is ACU. AGU. AGU, sorry. AGU, sorry. Um, so A is the first letter. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Serine. S-E-R. So you just find each three-letter block? Yeah, so you can do it by looking at the first letter first. This is my second letter, and this is my third letter. You just go, oh. So if you had something that said code, code this up on this table, you just pick up. How do you know which three to... I mean, I would give you, you the sequence. Us, I mean, you gave us zip. Oh, just go by whatever you give us. Well, I would give you zip. We're just putting together threes. I don't give you a huge amount to do on okay. the test or the quiz, right? Okay. So you just go, oh, what's the second one? CC. C C U. Proline. Proline. Proline, or P R O. So what you would do on your paper is you would go S-E-R, right? So this is serine, this is S-E-R, right? CCU was proline, P-R-O. Nobody, I well actually probably if you used it, if you did the, if you were like a genetic person and you were doing it, you probably would have the genetic code memorized, so I'm sure after a while you'd use it and you're like, well, I don't know what that is, right? But you would never memorize it. You would always use your table. Okay. So, so this is the genetic code, right? So we have the sequence of nitrogenous bases coding for the sequence of amino acids. Do we need to know this chart then for the test? The chart would be on the test. Oh, it will be. Okay. Yes. So you'll just have to use the chart okay. to figure it out. Now notice that there are no T's in your chart. So you, if I give you a strand of DNA, you first have to transcribe it and then use the chart, right? If you don't transcribe it, you're going to be like, well, you might, you might, you know, you might use CCA, you know, it might be CCA, and you're like, oh, I'm just going to use the DNA, you know, because it says CCA in there, but that is the, it's the messenger RNA codon that is in that table, okay? Okay. Okay. So that is, the, that is the second characteristic of the genetic material. The first one is it's got to make copies of itself. The second one is it's got to be able to code for biologically significant molecules, right? So um, the um, thing I want to talk about now is messenger RNA processing, okay? This actually happens before translation. Okay? So this occurs before translation in the nucleus.
So my messenger RNA has different parts of it. So if I, I'm going to draw my strand of messenger RNA, and I'm not going to put in the A, U, G, Cs, right? I'm just going to kind of ignore that idea right now. And part of this messenger RNA strand is what is called introns. Okay, so this is introns. Intron is short for intervening sequences. So intervening sequences. Okay, they must be cut out. They do not code for protein. And this was the finding of introns was like, whoa, why is that? It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Like a gene is supposed to be a gene. You have a sequence of nucleotides. They should be all together. They should be um, just simply code for the protein, right? And so it's like, oh, now there's this uh, there's additional um, kind of layer of confusion in that if I'm looking at a DNA, there's parts of the DNA that have to be cut out in order for translation to be successful, okay? So if it's not an intron, then it is an exon. So I'm gonna put, this is exon one, this is exon two. So the exons are good. Right, so they are code that produces the protein. Okay, so there is an enzyme. You don't need to know what it's called. But it's kind of got a, not a cute name. It's called a spliceozyme, and the spliceozyme cuts the introns out and slices. It's like a. It's like if you were using film and you were making a movie, you would cut sections of the movie out and you would splice it back together. And so there's an enzyme that cuts the introns out and splices them back together. And it does so in, and it can do so in different orders, right? So a spliceozyme, oops, I don't know if I, know if I have to spell that. Enzyme that cuts exons out and, oops, not exons, introns. So this is on the, on the mRNA. Yeah, this is messenger RNA processing and splices exons back together. Now the amazing thing here is it splices them back together in different orders. So if I'm creating my thing, it can be E1, E2, <coughs> E3. Okay, so it could be in that order. It could also be like E2, E1, E3. Okay, so the way it slices it back determines the outcome. So these would produce different proteins. Okay, this is what is called messenger RNA shuffling. Messenger RNA exon, sorry, exon shuffling. So the exons are shuffled around. And this is why a single gene can actually produce more than one protein. Okay, so this would be these are from a single gene, right? So one gene can produce more than one protein. Okay, through exon shuffling. 
So this was huge when they discovered this. It was like big deal. Exxon Shuffle was super important. There's been a lot of research um, looking at exon shuffling to produce variation in the antibodies that our body produces in response to infection. Because if you think about it, um, our bodies are can have novel bacteria or viruses in put into them, and they have to produce just the right antibody to um, to fight off that infection. And so they think exon shuffling is really important in the production of, of highly variable antibodies. So this was a big the deal. Do um, we know what the purpose of the introns are? No. We don't. Some people think that they some we'll talk about this, but some people think they're junk DNA. They could also be, um, we've discovered, and we'll talk about this when we talk about mutations, but we've discovered that um, our DNA, some of our DNA is parasitic in that the, its only function is to make more copies of itself and insert those copies. So we have like parasitic DNA that's, that's making our genome expand by just inserting copies into our genes. So it could be parasites that, are, that our um, body just has to cut out of the genome. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop there for today and you'll have your quiz next Wednesday. So where does it go? Where does the intron go? They get recycled. So it's in the nucleus, the introns get cut out, and they probably just get back broken back down into nucleotides so that they can be used to produce more messenger RNA during transcription. Because all the all the components have to be floating around in there to go from DNA to messenger RNA for a messenger molecule to be built. So they could just be recycled and used to produce more messenger RNA. Michelle, yep. I sent you a message. Um, just totally ignored it. I figured it out. Do you relax? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I checked my messages before coming to class. No. <laughs> it was regarding the online quiz. Oh, okay. I already seen that. Okay. <laughs> Somehow I didn't get through to me. I can see students texting me during class. Yep. That's <laughs> fine. I guess I got a question. My percentage of the grade is like, would be better. Would that be better? The midterm exam? Because the midterm exam is a huge chunk of the grade. And the final exam is going to be worth 200 points. So the little points the little point you get on the quizzes are not going to be very good. This is crazy. <laughs>